work, second uh, censorship resistant uh, evasion talk uh, will be presented by Hadi Solfagari uh, on uh, practical censorship evasion leveraging CDNs, please. Hello, my name is Hadi Zolfavari, and this is a work with um, me and my advisor, Amir, and it's about how we can use um, content delivery networks to evade uh, internet censorship. So let's first start off by looking at why um, CDNs are any special in the case of internet censorships. So say we have a website like CNN.com, which is hosted on a CDN, and uh, to access this website, a user would be making a connection to a CDN edge server. Now, this, uh, at the same time, this CDN edge server would also be um, hosting multiple other websites as well. So if a uh, sensor who wants to block CNN.com does so by blocking the CDN edge server, he would effectively be blocking all websites hosted on that CDN. So that's why um, sensors uh, tend to refrain from using IP filtering for um, censoring CDN hosted content, and instead they use DNS interference or uh, deep packet inspection attacks. Now, CDN browsing systems are a new class of um, uh, censorship circumvention um, systems which take advantage of this. And essentially, um, what they want to do is they want to have some mechanism built in them to obtain um, an IP address for one of many um, different, one of many um, CDN edge servers of a CDN. And as long as they can obtain that IP address, they can access all websites also than that CDN without making a DNS request. So the first CDN browsing system is Cache Browser, which was um, designed at our lab at UMass Amherst. It was presented here at CTS last year. And the way it works is very simple. Um, basically, it just contacts a uh, remote bootstrapper for obtaining uh, a, a CDN edge server of the CDN which a website is hosted on. And then it just up updates the ETC host file of a user so that the next time the user wants to access that website, he could do so by, uh, without making a DNS request at all. And um, to avoid DPI attacks, uh, Cache Browser relies on the website to use, um, sorry, to use HTTPS to have an encrypted channel between itself and the CDN edge server. So in this work, uh, what we do is we uh, identify two potential attacks on CDN browsing systems in general. And we see that both attacks um, allow the sensors to reveal the destinations which, a, um, which the user wants to uh, access. Both attacks apply on Cache Browser, but because Cache Browser has a very simple design, it doesn't allow us um, to make the modifications we need uh, to overcome these attacks. So we implement a new system, which we call CDN Reaper. Also, despite being good in terms of having a low cost and good performance, um, CDN browsing systems have a major limitation, um, which is that they can only be used for browsing websites which are hosted on CDNs. So in the second part of, our, uh, of my talk, I'll be um, analyzing um, popular websites to see what fraction of websites are actually um, CDN browsable. And uh, we want to see that this fraction isn't as high as we want it to be. So we devise um, some techniques to be able to use CDN browsing um, techniques to even browse websites which aren't fully hosted on CDNs. So I'll start off by talking about two attacks um, on CDN browsing systems, which allow sensors to view, know what websites the user wants, users want to access. So I mentioned that um, in CDN browsing systems, uh, the system relies on websites to use HTTPS in order to overcome deep packet inspection attacks. But even when using HTTPS, uh, the TLS handshake protocol could uh, potentially uh, leak information about what website the user wants to access. And um, so the way HTTPS is um, deployed in CDNs, so CDNs uh, primarily want to uh, provide impro uh, performance improvements for the websites and so by, uh, by actions like caching. And to do so, they need to be able to view the content going through the CDN edge servers. So even when uh, HTTPS is being used, uh, the CDNs want to act as a man in the middle attacker, um, well not attackers, but they want to act, act as man in the middles. And to do so, they need to be able to provide a valid certificate back to the user. Now, one way of providing valid certificates for websites is for CDNs to just simply use shared certificates between all websites. But usually, this isn't um, what we want, and we want to provide custom certificates for every website. So CDNs have two main mechanisms for doing this. Um, they can assign dedicated IP addresses to every website. So based on the IP address which is being requested, the CDN edge server knows what certificate to return. Or it can, um, or 
we can use a server name indication field in the TLS handshake protocol, which simply allows the client to state in plain text what a website is trying to access. Now you can see what the problem here is in terms of internet censorship. If we use dedicated IP addresses, well, sensors can use IP filtering. And if we use server name indication fields, um, the sensors can see in plain text what websites are being accessed. And in general, if we're gonna, if we're gonna use custom certificates, the certificates themselves are in plain text. So using those, the sensors can see what websites users are trying, users are trying to access. So we see that even when using HTTPS, the sensors can still learn what websites are being ac uh, accessed by the user and simply relying on HTTPS isn't enough. Our second attack on CDN browsing systems is a unique type of website finger fingerprinting attack, um, which is only applicable to this kind of censorship circumvention system. And um, it's based on the observation that modern websites, uh, we know, are composed of um, various different web objects. And um, so for a website to load on a browser, the browser is going to have to make multiple connections to potentially different destinations. Now, in traditional types of um, pro, um, circumvention systems, which were proxy-based, all these multiple connections would have gone through a single encrypted tr uh, channel to a proxy server. So all the an, an adversary could see is a single encrypted channel. And to perform uh, website fingerprinting attacks, all he had were packet analysis-based um, features. But since CDN browsing systems are proxyless, um, all connections are made to the original destinations. Now, since um, these destinations are in CDNs, they don't directly reveal what website the user is trying to access, but they do provide a rich uh, source of information for performing uh, website fingerprinting attacks. So using this, uh, we devise a unique type of website fingerprinting attack, which is based on the uh, different connections to different destinations uh, which a, uh, a user makes for loading a website. So to extract the features for our um, classification, we uh, monitored a website being uh, loaded and we, we viewed the connections made. And then we labeled each connection um, based on the organization which that IP, the IP address of that connection belongs to. And then we just recorded the amount of traffic uh, each website is uh, transferring between every different organization and we used these as our features. So we experimented and we selected 100 different pages from um, censored pages with HTTPS support. And we saw that uh, all these 100 pages, um, they contacted a total of 250 different destinations. And we trained uh, a decision tree based classifier um, using um, the amount of traffic flow between different organizations. And so we gathered four, uh, 30 instances for each page and using our classifier, we were able to obtain an accuracy for predicting the correct website of 99%. So we wanted to see how our classifier um, compares to previous um, website fingerprinting classifiers, which were based on packet analysis features. We selected uh, Tao Wang's um, KNN classifier, which was presented at uh, using 2014. And using, um, we selected this classifier because it had a wide range of different um, packet size and packet timing based features. Uh, using the data we gained for our websites, we trained a classifier and we were able to get an accuracy of 94%. So you see our classifier performs slightly better in terms of accuracy, um, but also performs much better in terms of um, classifying and training time. And using, so in, to conclude this section, using um, destination-based features which were uh, available in CDN browsing systems because proxies aren't used, we were able to um, develop a much more efficient and uh, accurate uh, website fingerprinting attack. So in order to overcome these attacks, um, we developed a new system called CDN Reaper, which is different in design and how hack cache browser works and allows us to make the modifications we need uh, to defend against the attacks. So in this section, I'll explain how we defend against both attacks. Now to uh, fix the destination leakage in the TLS protocol, uh, essentially what we need to do is we need to um, either hide um, the, any place which is leaking the destination or trick the sensor into thinking we're accessing one place like one uh, overt destination, while well, instead we're accessing another. And the challenge here is that um, there are many different CDNs and, and CDN deployments in the world, and every one of them could react differently um, in different circumstances we create in order to um, make our defense. For example, um, we, to hide the destination which we are accessing, we could um, want to um, put, remove the SNI field um, from the TLS handshake protocol, but uh, we could only do so if the CDN would allow us to, do, um, to have empty SNI fields. 
or we, we could potentially want to have an overt site in the um, SNI field while we're actually accessing a censored website through the TLS connection, but we could also just do that if the CDN would allow us to do that. So we analyzed some popular CDNs to see um, if they would allow us to do that, and um, we saw that it, this wasn't the case in all scenarios. I'll talk more about that later. So to overcome uh, the TLS leakage, um, CDN Reaper is uh, essentially designed as an HTTP proxy, which acts, like, acts as a man in the middle. And uh, it does so by using a locally generated and um, a root certificate, which is stored locally on the user's machine, and is, it is made to be trusted by the browser. So when a browser wants to make a connection to a censored website, CDN Reaper would contact the bootstrapper to obtain CDN-related information for our website. Uh, this could be uh, like the CDN Edge server, how to handle the SNI field, and potential um, fake domains um, which are hosted on that CDN, which could be used as overt websites. And so in this case, um, CDN Reaper is using a overt website um, called front.com, which is not censored, and, and to access the CDN Edge server. And in response, the CDN Edge server would provide a certificate for front.com, which CDN Reaper would validate. And then using the trusted root certificate, CDN Reaper would generate a certificate for the censored.com to provide back to the user. So this allows CDN Reaper to, um, to modify the connections in a way which um, would allow it to remove the TLS leakage as long as the CDN um, allows it to do so. So the second attack we had was a uh, domain-based uh, website fingerprinting. And in order to defend against this attack, essentially what we need to do is um, modify the connections or modify the traffic flow of the user in a way to make um, the traffic flow uniform across uh, different organizations. And uh, the main way CDN Reaper does this is by injecting traffic into the user's network. So the user is allowed to specify a maximum amount of overhead he is willing to accept. And until this overhead is reached, CDN Reaper will send decoy requests um, to different destinations different organizations in order to um, make the traffic uniform across these organizations. And to keep the uh, required overhead low, uh, CDN Reaper also allow allows the uh, user to uh, drop some uh, requests which it sees as non-critical for the user's browsing experience, such as advertisement or analytical requests. So this plot shows um, how our defense works um, uh, against our attack. Uh, the blue squares are for the defense when we're only adding traffic, and the red triangles are for when we're also dropping traffic. So you can see with an uh, overhead of uh, like 100%, we can decrease the accuracy of the attacker to about under 50%. And if we go to like 200% overhead, we can increase it to almost zero. So um, CDN, Reaper is, um, CDN Reaper's core is written in Python. It's um, composed of three main components a proxy server, which is in charge of um, interacting with the prox uh, with a browser, uh, the resolver component, which is in charge of making the TLS modifications needed to remove the um, TLS leakage. It does so by contact contacting a bootstrapper, which is also a CDN browsable service, to avoid um, being blocked by sensors. And there's a scrambler component, which is in charge of uh, applying the defense needed for uh, overcoming uh, the website fingerprinting. CDN Reaper's core has an API, which um, our Chrome and Firefox plugins use to communicate with. And we also have a graphical user interface, uh, which uses the same API to communicate with the uh, core daemon. Um, so I'm just going to show you a quick demo of uh, how CDN Reaper looks. Um, so this is the design. Um, say we will have a website, uh, vmeo.com. Uh, which is censored by um, some censoring region. So expect that over here, we're not gonna see vimeo.com and instead we're gonna see like an error message. Uh, so what the user would do is he would click on uh, this cache browser icon in order to have CDN Reaper um, access this. And you can see the request coming here. Um, so these are the requests made by the browser which are coming through CDN Reaper and for each request you can see um, the information like this for this request is uh, hosted on Fastly and uh, the SNI field is empty and this is the edge server address which is used. Um, I don't know why this doesn't look correctly. Yeah. And so also uh, CDN, 
So uh, the graphical user interface also gives the option for the user to include his own bootstrapping information. If he has some, he knows, uh, he has knowledge of some websites hosted on CDNs which aren't included in our, in our own bootstrapping um, service. And he also has the option of um, setting the scrambler, like um, specifying whether he wants um, uh, he wants uh, an advertisement request to be dropped or not, and the amount of overhead he is willing to accept. So um, the second part of our talk, my talk, I'm going to be talking about, um, I'm, I'm going to see what fraction of the uh, websites or popular websites are in fact CDN browsable. And I'm going to see if there is any way to extend this amount, to extend the reachability of CDN browsing systems, um, to include websites which aren't readily CDN browsable. Um, so in order to be CDN browsable, uh, there are two properties a website um, must have. First, it has to be hosted on a CDN. And second, it must support HTTPS to avoid DPI attacks. Now let's look deeper into these. Um, there are two ways a website can be hosted on a CDN. Uh, first, it can be what we call a partial CDN hosting, in which the website only stores its static files on a CDN and uh, has the user access all the dynamic content from the website's own servers. Uh, this isn't good for CDN browsing because the dynamic content is still going to be blocked by sensors. The second method is uh, what we call full CDN hosting, in which in order to access the website, the user is always going to go through the CDN edge servers. And full CDN hosting is, in fact, what we want um, for CDN browsing to be possible. Now, um, for HTTPS support, we saw that um, in order to be able to remove the TLS leakage in um, the TLS handshake protocol, it kind of depends on uh, how the CDNs respond to our um, request when we're playing around with the SNI field. And in some cases, um, the, the CDN would not allow us to remove uh, the SNI field at all. For example, um, Cloudflare does not allow uh, MTS SNI fields, and it also doesn't allow the SNI field to be um, different from the actual requested website. So in order to request a website from Cloudflare, we have to include the original SNI field, which would allow the sensors to know what website is being accessed. We call such CDNs, which have this property of not allowing us to remove the uh, SNI field, um, leaking HTTPS CDNs. And what we actually want for CDN browsing to be possible is uh, not CDNs with non-leaking HTTPS. So we analyzed the uh, top 10,000 Alexa websites to see um, how many of them are actually in the class that we want. We classified the websites in five categories. Um, the first one are full CDN and non-leaking HTTPS websites. These are websites which are readily CDN browsable in an unblockable uh, way. The second class is full CDN but leaking HTTPS. These are only CDN browsable uh, against sensors which do not use DPI on the TLS handshake protocol. Uh, third class, full CDN but HTTP only. These are only CDN browsable against website against sensors which do not use H um, DPI at all. And then partial CDN and no CDN websites which aren't CDN browsable because they are hosted on CDNs. Now, as you can see, a large fraction of this um, a graph is uh, for partial CDNs. So a large portion of the websites out there are partial CDNs, meaning they, they only have their static files hosted on CDNs. So we'd really like to be able to um, browse these websites as well. So uh, we, de we designed two techniques uh, which we can use to uh, actually CDN browse even some partial CDN websites. The first one is what we call content wrappers. And it's based on the observation that um, a lot of partial CDN websites I'm sorry. A lot of partial CDN websites are in fact, um, I don't know why this is happening, sorry. Okay, so a lot of partial CDN websites um, are such that, um, that what the users are actually interested in in the website are the static content themselves. So you could consider, for example, um, image sharing websites or um, video sharing websites or even news websites which host uh, like, uh, videos of their news. Uh, what users actually want from these websites are the static content, which these static contents are hosted on partial on CDNs. So what we propose is using um, what we call content wrappers, which are simply just pages, um, simple pages, which are CDN browsable, and they host the static contents of these partial CDN websites. And then using a CDN browsing system, we can easily access these websites and view the content that we are interested in. So for example, this is a screenshot of a um, content wrapper we created for um, viewing BBC videos. And it's just a CDN browsable service which hosts uh, videos from 
Akamai, which Akamai is a CDN uh, which hosts uh, the videos for BBC. So um, what if we are actually, we are interested in the dynamic content um, apart from the static content of websites? Uh, the problem is that this dynamic content is hosted on um, non-CDN servers, on actual website servers, so they can be censored. But what we propose here is that we um, use what we call dynamic mirrors, which are essentially just similar to proxies for loading uh, the non-CDN content or the dynamic content of um, the websites. And then we use CDN, the same CDN browsing mechanism to load all the um, static content of those websites. And um, so this has a problem in that it's introducing a third party into the system, which is a, um, which is a mirror. And the whole benefit of CDN browsing systems was that they don't have third parties, they don't have proxies, and so they're very low cost. And even so, we're gonna see that um, because we are only loading the dynamic content from these proxies, and the bulk of a website's content is actually the static content, which is hosted on CDNs, uh, compared to um, traditional proxy-based systems, this has a very low cost. And just to note, we have, uh, we've created a tool uh, to create uh, mirrors for websites easily uh, by one click, it's called Mirror My Site, you can check it out. And so this is just a comparison of um, the bandwidth cost, the amount of bandwidth uh, on, the, on a third party server for loading four websites in our dynamic mirror um, and uh, compared to a proxy based system, in this case, Meek. So you see, um, because our website is only loading the dynamic content and not this uh, static content from um, third parties, we have a much lower cost on um, third parties. And so the CDN browsing system is still a much lower cost system than traditional systems. So to summarize, um, we uh, identified two potential attacks on CDN browsing systems. We saw that both attacks apply to cache browser. So we developed a new CDN browsing system which was capable of overcoming these attacks. And CDN browsing systems in general have a limitation of not being able to browse all websites. We did a comprehensive analysis of how many of these websites are in fact CDN browsable. And we also uh, devised two mechanisms uh, in order to uh, browse websites which are only partially CDN browsable, which were content uh, wrappers and then nightmares. You could also check out the code for CDN uh, for cache. Um, oh, I should note that um, we, at the end, we decided to keep the name cache browser on our system. So we don't call it CDN Reaper and call it cache browser. And you could check out the code for cache browser at these links. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks again. Okay, questions? Hello, Chong Jie Wang from uh, UC Riverside. Uh, uh, thank you for your great talk. Uh, I'm just very curious uh, in the architecture, the uh, CDN Reaper and Bootstrapper, mm -hmm. uh, is it possible to be, cause some single point failure if the sensors can detect those services and the IP blocking them? Um, well, the bootstrapper, even if the uh, sensors know where the bootstra um, bootstrappers is, because bootstrappers are themselves um, CDN, uh, CDN browsable services, they can't censor them by the traditional techniques. Like they can't um, use IP filtering for censoring them. So essentially every technique we use to, uh, for CDN browsing is also applicable to um, the bootstrappers themselves. Um, unless the sensors can de detect them and do like uh, DOS attacks on them, in which case, um, yeah, that's possible. But the, the thing is that the bootstrapping services are, um, so CDN Reaper doesn't uh, just use one bootstrapping service. Uh, some community can create its own bootstrapping service with using the same REST API that um, our bootstrapper is using. And so they could be potentially a multiple bootstrapping service. What about the CDN Reaper? Um, this, uh, this was, what I was talking about was CDN Reaper. So cache browser, uh, cache browser is designed for uh, bootstrapper. So the old cache browser design, it was only, so what it used, um, it proposed several methods for um, bootstrapping. One of them was like suite, was just an email-based uh, circumvention technique. It was a very simple design, uh, which wasn't very inef uh, efficient for doing um, many bootstrapping uh, requests. So what I mentioned was uh, for CDN Reaper. Great, thanks. Matt Wright, RIT. Um, I just have a basic uh, clarification request. Can you go back to where you talk about uh, decoy um, doing uh, 
the, the decoys and then mm. this part? Oh, you mean the yeah, defense? Uh, the, the, the traffic yeah. analysis defense? Or? Yeah. Um, can you just, uh, since no one else is asking questions, can you just explain it uh, again? This <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, sure. So um, essentially, a CDN Reaper is an HTTPS proxy, right? So it's, it, it accepts HTTPS connections from the uh, browser, and then it contacts the bootstrapper to receive, uh, so it asks the bootstrapper what are the CDN information of the sensor.com, and the bootstrapper would give it um, the CDN edge servers, um, how to contact the CDN regarding the SNI, and put, uh, other uncensored domains on the CDN. Then CDN Reaper would use this information to contact the edge server which it received uh, using the SNI rules which it received and with the, domain, the fake domains that it received. And then the CDN edge server, because a fake domain was used in the SNI field, it would return a different certificate um, from what the browser is expecting. Right? So we can't return that certificate back to the browser because it would be a certificate mismatch. So instead, CDN Reaper uses the trusted certificate to create a, a new certificate for the censored website and it returns that back to the browser. Okay, so where does the bootstrapper live? Oh, the bootstrapper, so our bootstrapper is a um, service hosted on Amazon CloudFront. So in order to access, the, it's a remote um, web service with a REST API, and in order to access it, the same, the same mechanism is used to access it, right? So uh, CDN Reaper inter internally knows how to access um, CDN, the CDN of CloudFront, and then it will use that to access um, the bootstrapper. Could the attacker get a copy of CDN Reaper and then figure out also how to contact? Yeah, the, the attacker software? can, the attacker knows how to contact. The, the whole idea is that. Um, but then could he use that information to block your connections to Bootstrapper? No, he can't. Because, um, so what can the attacker do? The attacker can, uh, he can't do IP filtering because um, IP filtering would essentially block all websites with on CDN. There is no DNS request going on. And then the DPI wouldn't work because we're not using the SNI field. Okay. Yeah. Maybe it's useful to point out that probably that's the name Bootstrapper, right? Because you are bootstrapping your own yeah. service. Yeah, sure. Exactly. Okay. Uh, we have time for more questions? Yeah, maybe one more quick question. Sure. Did, did you actually consider, talk with the CDN providers, consider the incentives and the disadvantages for them for supporting such mechanism? Um, we didn't, but for example, um, Cache Browser is one of the CDNs which we have the most problem with. Um, I'm sorry, Cloudflare is one of the CDNs we have the most problem with because it doesn't allow us to run with SNI. And they, in fact, actually did this in response to a different uh, circumvention system, Lantern, which was using a similar mechanism, and they didn't want Lantern to actually apply this. So some CDNs are actually working against this. So it would be a good um, problem to actually um, reach out to them, see how much they're willing to support. Or, or, or to investigate how to incentivize them. Yeah. Yeah, that's what they mean. Okay, me, me. Okay. Oh, next. So, can I just comment quickly? Oh, sure. sure when I talked with Cloudflare, they said their SNI handling, that was just internal architecture. It was not a decision against land. Oh, it wasn't? So okay. That's what they said. Uh, it does seem that uh, CDNs are moving towards SNI enforcement, hmm. which is unfortunate. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's uh, thank Hadi again.